Hi everyone, welcome to Computer Science 225. This is week seven, and in this week we're going to be talking about customizing some of the things relative to the command line. First, we're gonna talk about customizing the shell program. Now, when you log in to the CPSC server, there's sort of several programs involved in that process. First of all, you have the terminal program itself, which is probably putty if you're using Windows, and just your terminal program if you're using Mac or Linux. Then you have the SSH program, and what that's doing is that's allowing you to communicate with the other machine, the CPSC server, over the internet. Then you have the shell. The shell is the program that is actually taking in and interpreting your commands that you're giving it. So the shell program is sort of the piece of that that we're going to be talking about today. There's lots of different shell programs, and it's called a shell, by the way, because it's sort of like the veneer over the machine. It's the program that you're interacting with in order to actually do things on the CPSC server, the shell. There's lots of different shells available. The most common one that we're going to be using for this class is the bash shell. That stands for the born again shell because it is a newer version, a newer implementation of an older shell, which was just called the born shell, which was created by somebody uh, who had the last name born. And so born again shell is sort of like a play on words and that's where the name bash comes from. Bash is the program that is actually taking in your command. So if you type ls, bash is the program that says, oh, okay, you typed ls, let me find the ls program and then execute that program. It's the program that keeps track of what directory you're in when you do your cd and pwd commands and things like that. It's the thing that's interpreting your commands in order to carry them out. There are other shells available. There's uh, Z shell is kind of popular. There's a shell called fish. There's older ones uh, like the original born shell, I suppose, and TC shell, things like that. But bash is probably the most popular one and it's the default on Linux. So that's what we're going to be using. Now this program can be customized. It's not uh, the way that you customize a GUI program, however, if you have like an IDE or a web browser and you want to change the settings, there's like a settings menu where you can click on menu items and check boxes and stuff like that. Instead, the way that the shell is customized is going to be by creating a special file containing commands given to the shell to cause it to change its behavior. So we'll see how to do all that. Some of those things, as we'll see, are just sort of convenience things or personal preference things, but there's other times when changing the settings in the shell is going to be necessary. For instance, if you install a piece of software and you want to be able to run it like a command, you might need to add it to your path variable. So we're going to see how to do that. Today, we'll also see how to customize the Vim text editor, which just like the bash shell is customized by putting different commands into a specific file. So we'll see what commands, or rather what settings are available for Vim that you might be interested in for customizing it to your preference. So let me go ahead and pull up a terminal window and we can get started. So the first thing we need to talk about in terms of customizing the bash shell is environment variables. Environment variables are sort of like variables in programming in that they store values and you can sort of check their value. They're more closely related to like global variables that you might have that can be accessible sort of anywhere. So we can list out what environment variables we have by doing the env command. So if I do this, it will list all of the environment variables that I have on the system and what they're set equal to. A lot of these we don't care about, uh, but we have got the uh, shell variable here. They're all uppercase. Uh, the environment variables, the global ones, all start with, or rather contain uppercase letters. So shell is an environment variable and the value that it's equal to is slash bin slash bash. So the shell variable is always set equal to the path to the shell that you're currently running. I also have one set for my editor, which I set to Vim. Some programs will read this editor environment variable. So if they want you to like edit a file, like Git does for instance, they can check this editor variable and see what editor that you prefer. The PWD keeps track of your present working directory. I'm pretty sure all the PWD command does is really just read this environment variable and print out its contents to you. Most of the other ones we don't really need to worry about or care about. We will talk about PS1 in just a bit. That one you can see is this kind of bizarre looking string of characters here. 
So if we want to see all the environment variables, again, we can do this env command, but it's probably more common to want to print out or check the value of a specific variable. For instance, if we're writing a script, we might want to do something with this uh, user variable to see like what the username of the person is. Or maybe we want to go to their home directory inside of a script, we might check the present working directory, or rather their, uh, their home directory as, as an environment variable. And so the way that you can reference environment variables if you want to see their value is by putting a dollar sign before them. So I can print out the user variable with this echo command by referencing dollar user. Now that I think about it, I don't know if we've seen the echo command yet. All that echo does is it prints out whatever information you give it. So you don't really need the quotes for this. I can say echo hello there, and it will just print back to me hello there. It's not very much use for using on the command line just as a command by itself like this, unless you want to give yourself affirmations or something. You are doing great. Uh, it is useful in scripts. It's sort of like system.out.println. If you're writing a shell script, it's how you display information to the user. But uh, it does have a usage for checking the values of these environment variables, because if you have an environment variable, something that begins with a dollar inside of an echo command, it will be resolved to whatever the value of that environment variable is. So I can say something like this, your home directory is dollar home and then it will replace or substitute the environment variable with the actual value that it contains so if you want to just check one of them like this echo dollar pwd it will print out the value of that particular variable whichever one it is next we can talk about setting environment variables we can set environment variables with the export command so we can say export then give the name of the environment variable, this time without the dollar sign. So I can say export editor equals nano, for instance. And uh, Bash is quite picky about the syntax of these things. It kind of looks weird as a programmer for me to not put spaces around the equal sign, but you can't, in fact, put spaces there. So just editor, and then immediately the equal sign, and then immediately the new value that you want this environment variable to have. And then if I run that command, then I've changed the environment variable editor so that it now refers to nano instead. I would never do this myself because I think nano is quite an inferior text editor to Vim, uh, but that's just personal preference. But this allows me uh, to set an environment variable to a new value. You can also create new environment variables if you want to. I could make export favorite drink equals coffee, for instance. And now I've created a new environment variable. We don't really need to do this, but you can create new ones in addition to setting the ones that already exist using the same syntax of export, then the name of the environment variable, and then an equal sign, and then whatever it is that you want it to be equal to. All right, let's try setting another one that will have a actual effect for us. And that's this one I referenced here to this PS1 variable. People of my generation, when you hear PS1, you think of PlayStation 1, because that was the thing when I was in like high school. I definitely def def just dated myself by saying this. But here, PS1 actually stands for prompt string 1. If you remember, the prompt is this part of the shell where it is sort of uh, letting you type in your command. And the prompt string is this text that appears before you can start typing your command in. And PS1 is actually a code for what should be displayed to the left side of your prompt. And so we can change this if I want. If I want like a super old school prompt, I can set my PS1 equal to just a dollar sign in a space. And now if you see, that immediately takes effect. Now I have just a dollar sign for my prompt. I no longer have the extra information of my username and the system I'm logged into and my working directory and stuff like that. And so now my prompt is just the single dollar sign. I can export PS1 to be whatever I feel like, and it will be displayed here. So I can say CPSC greater than sign, something like that. And then that's become my prompt. So setting this one does actually have an effect, setting PS1. Now it has an effect in this current session that I'm logged into, 
But if I log out of the CPSC server and then log back in to the CPSC server with an SSH command, if you look, my prompt has been restored. Now it is back to being set what it was before. So these export commands that change your environment variables, they actually only have an effect in the current session. If you log out and log back in, they are reset back to sort of their default values. And so at this point, PS1 is no longer equal to what I set it to here, it's equal to what the default is. Likewise, if I echo out, I think it was favorite drink, you'll see that this one is not set to anything at all. If you have an environment variable that's not set to anything, and you try to read it, you don't actually get an error. It's just empty, it, it, rather it's equal to an empty string. So this one was lost as well. So now we need to talk about how you can change your environment variables in such a way that those changes persist even when you log out and log back in again. That's done by editing this file called dot bash underscore profile. And I actually have an existing bash profile with lots of stuff in it. So I'm going to move it uh, to let's just say .bp, and then I'll copy the one that you all should get so that it'll look the same as when you log in. Okay, so now if you open your bash profile, it should look just like the one you're about to see here, which has just a comment in it saying that your custom settings go into this file. There are actually a couple of different bash files. You, if you look for it, will also see .bashrc. And .bashrc, you'll see some people referencing that online as a place that you can put in these settings. But there's sort of two problems with putting things into bashrc. One is it already has a bunch of stuff in it that you don't really want to mess with. And the other is that if you put in commands into your bashrc that cause output, like uh, printing things to the screen, then it will actually break some file transfer programs like FileZilla that we looked at in week three. So while you can put some of these things into .bashrc, it's better to put them into .bash underscore profile. This is just for your own settings when you log in. So in this file, you can open it up and you can put in changes to these environment variables by typing the commands just as you would type them on the shell itself. So I can export ps1 equals, let's give it this sort of thing for my prompt. And then here, just for fun, we can put this environment variable, which is oops, uh, entirely useless. I'll just do drink equals coffee, like that. Now, if I log out, exiting the system, and then log back in again, those things should take effect. As you can see now, my environment variable for PS1 has changed the prompt. So now it has this prompt that just says uh, system like this. And that is my prompt when I do any of these other commands. Likewise, I should be able to echo drink and see that it's equal to coffee. The uh, .bash profile file, what it essentially is, is it's essentially a shell script, which we'll talk a lot more detail about later on towards the end of the semester. But it's a script that's run automatically every time you log in. So any commands that you put in here are essentially executed by the bash shell as soon as you log in. So any changes you want to make to your environment variables can go in here, and then they'll take effect each time you log in. All right, so about the PS1 variable, the default that I had it equal to with like my username and all that stuff can be gotten from uh, putting sort of all of these codes in, into there. And so one of the codes, for instance, is slash u for your username. And another one is slash h, I believe. Yeah, slash h for the host name. And so if you want, you can uh, put those codes into your PS1 and sort of customize the way that it looks. Also, I should mention that if you just put things into this bash profile file, by default, if you just save and quit the file, nothing happens because the file is only run every time that you log in. So you can either log back out and log back in to see them take effect, or you can use this command called source. Source takes a file and essentially runs it as a shell script. So I can source dot bash profile and that should make it take effect. And now you can see I have my username and the host name as my prompt here. So uh, you can 
choose your PS1, your prompt string to be whatever you like, whatever you think is convenient, or you could just leave it as the default if you don't care. There's this website which is linked on the notes for this week called Bash RC Generator, and it lets you sort of drag and drop your different components into your Bash prompt string and uh, even like change the colors of them and stuff like that. So if you want to really customize it, you can use that. Then it will give you what the PS1 code essentially is that you can copy into your Bash profile. So uh, it's kind of a nerdy thing, but if you want to customize this text here, then you can do so to your heart's content. It's easier really to use the website to generate it because the codes are kind of uh, cumbersome. Okay, so that's the PS1 environment variable. There's another environment variable that is even never, I was going to say even more important, but I should really probably say important at all, which is this path environment variable, which as you can see for me is equal to this. It's equal to slash user local s bin, slash user local bin, slash user s bin, slash user bin, slash s bin, slash bin, slash user games, slash user local games, slash snap, slash bin, all separated by colons. And what this environment variable does is it specifies all of the directories that we should search in when you give a command to the shell. So when I type ls, what it actually does is it searches, because it needs to find this program somewhere, it searches for ls inside of user, or that's not the right one. First, it searches in user local sbin to see if there's an ls command. Then it searches user local bin to see if there's an ls. Then it searches here, and then here, and then here. It goes down the line searching each directory path one by one until it finds the command that we're looking for. You can use the which command to see where in the path the given command was found. So if I type which ls, it'll tell me that the ls was found in slash user slash bin. So it didn't find it here, nor here, nor here but it did find it here in slash user slash bin, which is really where most of the commands will be. All right, this is important because if you want to set it up so that there are other directories that it searched for for commands, for instance, if you write your own programs and you want to be able to run them just like the regular commands just by typing their name, then they have to be in the path. So for instance, I have this program, let me see, in my bin directory. I put program.py into my bin directory. So bin, by the way, stands for binary because historically programs are compiled binary files. The programs in slash user local sbin and slash user bin and all these things historically would be compiled binary files. That's sort of a little bit less true now because we have scripting languages like Python and things like that where the programs you're running might not necessarily actually be binaries, but that's why it's called bin. It's short for binaries or like executable programs. So I've made in my own directory a directory called bin where I want to put my own programs. I have only two on this system. One is program.py, which is just a simple um, Python 3 bin program.py program that works like this, where you can type in your name and it greets you back as an example. And then I also have this program copy to all, which takes a single file and copies it to a whole bunch of different directories, which I use for grading programs. <laughs> so I can like copy like an input file to like all of the uh, student submissions that I have to grade. So uh, I have these programs and I might want to run them. I might want to just from anywhere in my system be able to say something like this, program.py. But the pro problem with this is that it tells me that this command cannot be found because it wasn't in the path. The path governs what commands you can run just by typing their names out like this. Likewise, my copy to all program can't be run because it too is not in the path anywhere here. So one thing we might want to do is add this bin directory to the path so that no matter where I am in the file system, I will be able to just run those commands uh, just straight up just by typing their names. Now I can do it with a either an absolute path by typing slash bin, no, sorry, that's not right, slash home, slash faculty, slash ifinlay, slash bin, slash, we'll say program.py. And that lets me run it. I can run it that way. 
or I can run it with a relative path by doing slash bin or just right just rather bin slash program.py and that lets me run it too. So you can always run an executable file by giving the path to it. But the point of dollar path is that you should be able to just type commands just by giving their names. It would be super annoying if you always had to type slash user slash bin slash ls every time you want to do a file listing. So sometimes it's helpful or even necessary to add things into your path so that they can be found as commands. So we can do that. We can set our path to be equal to our bin directory. Home slash faculty, I finlay. Bin. And so now if I do this, I should be able to just type program.py and have it give me my name. Great. And I can also use this copy to all command, which if you don't give it any arguments, it does nothing. And so I can access these now just by typing their names because they are in my path. I set the path to slash home slash faculty slash ifinlay slash bin. And if I echo the path, we can see that's indeed what it's equal to. Now the problem is that if I do it this way, this is the only thing in my path. And so if I type ls, now it's not going to work any longer because slash user slash bin, which is where ls lives, is no longer in my path anywhere. And the bash shell is pretty helpful because it will tell you uh, this. Uh, in the older days, it would just say ls not found or something like this. But now it tells you that there's two ls's, slash bin slash ls and slash user bin ls. And it says it couldn't be located because these things are not included in your path environment variable. So it gives you a clue as to what you can do. So let me log out and log back in so that my environment variable is set back again. Uh, now I can type ls, but I can't type program.py because if you remember, the environment variables disappear when you uh, set them and then log out, unless you put them in your bash profile. So if I wanted to do this the right way, I could do this. I would, I guess, first open up my bash profile. And then we would export our path to be equal to whatever the path is now by referencing dollar $path on the right-hand side of the equal sign. This is sort of like how you can, in Java, set a variable equal to like itself plus something else, or in Python. And then we'll add in with a colon, because the different directories are separated by colons in the path. We'll add in slash home slash i. We can just do it like this. Actually, I'm not sure if we can. Let's just do a home faculty i finlay slash bin. Now, if I source this file to run it, now I should be able to type ls, <laughs> because that is still in my path. And I should also be able to run like program.py because that too is in my path at this point. If I echo out my path, then you'll see that it has all the original stuff that was in it. And then also it has home faculty I Finlay bin. So now if I search for any of these commands, it will find them in my own directory. So if you install software, sometimes you'll have to add the path where the software lives into your bin directory so that it can be run and it can be found and stuff like that. So that's why we talked about this. It's an important thing to be able to do. I typically always have a line like this in my bash profile so that I can make my own scripts and commands and have them be run just like they were regular old programs. All right, another way that we can customize the bash shell is by creating what are called aliases. Now aliases are just like the English word other names for like the same kind of thing. So for instance, when we looked at using the rm command back in week two, let me see if I have something I can delete. Let's make just an empty file for showing this off. When we looked at the rm command, I told you about the dash i flag to rm, which stands for interactive. And that will ask you first, double checking with you, if you want to delete something before it removes it. So here it'll ask me if I want to remove this empty text file called a.txt. And if I say no, it won't actually remove it. It will leave it there. Now you might want this to be the way that you always use rm. So if we want it to, we can make a new command with an alias. Let's call it like del for delete. And the way that this works is you say alias del, then an equal sign, and then in single quotes, you put in the command that you want it to alias to. 
So I can say rm-i here. Now once I've done that, it essentially makes a new command called del, which expands out to rm-i. So now if I say, if I spell it right, del a.txt, it essentially expands itself to be rm-i of a.txt. So again, it will ask me for confirmation before I want to do this. Then you can take it a step further, and instead of creating a new command, which is equal to sort of a custom version of an existing one, you can actually do it with the same command. So I can alias instead rm is equal to rm-i. And then whenever I type the rm command, it expands automatically to rm-i. Now you don't even really have to worry about it. You can just use rm as usual, and it will sort of like automatically supply the dash i flag for you every time. Because before it does rm a.txt, it expands the alias. So it actually gives the shell rm dash i a.txt. So now you've sort of baked in this argument to the rm command automatically as a default that you've created. These, like changing your environment variables, doesn't persist when you log out and log back in. So if we want to make this a permanent thing, we can put that into our bash profile as well. Just like the uh, export commands, we can type an alias in here. I can say alias rm is rm-i like this. And then once I've done that, if I, let's, I guess, log out and log back in, or we could have just sourced the file, now if I type rm on a.txt, it will always ask me if I want to do it first. We've, again, baked in to this command the dash i flag here. Another alias we can do that's helpful. I actually, uh, until I moved my bash profile, I forgot that this wasn't the default. But one thing ls can do is it can color the output for you, which will make it more easily discernible what is a file and what is a directory. And it also colors executable files different than regular ones and stuff like that. And that can be done with this ls dash dash color equals auto command. And what that does is it makes it so things are automatically colored. Directories are blue by default. Regular files are white. Executable programs are green. It does symbolic links teal, I think, and it maybe does some other things as well. I think archives, it colors red. I just find it helpful. And so we can make this the default as well by, again, adding an alias to our dot bash profile, which would say something like this, alias ls equals ls dash dash color equals auto. And so now, again, every time we do the ls command, it automatically will expand into ls with the dash dash color equals auto brought onto it. So now if I source this file again by running it like this, then now I can just type ls and it will put in the color option for us automatically, which is really nice. If we want to, for whatever reason, we can unalias the file by giving the full path to it. So I can say user bin ls to run sort of like the raw program with no uh, alias things interacting with it. Likewise, I can raw run rm by doing it like this, and now it takes off the interactive mode. So if you ever like need, for whatever reason, to run like the original program, then you can do it like this. You could also use the unalias command. If I unalias ls, then ls goes back to just the way that it was before. Uh, but Aliases are really nice. You can, for the most part, just set them in your .bash profile, and it will you will forget that it's not the default. Like, indeed, I forgot that ls doesn't color things by default. I rather thought that auto was the default. Uh, so it's nice if you have a command that you want to run it a certain way every time, you can make an alias for that. I have other aliases that I like. I have an alias called C that expands to clear because I like having a clear screen, but I'm also lazy and don't want to type the whole word every time. I also have one called LA, which expands to ls-a, and one called LL, which expands to ls-l, because I use those flags a lot. Now if I source my bash profile, 
I can use LL to just do a long listing and LA to give me a listing with all of the files shown. I just tend to find those useful. I use those a lot. Oops, I guess now I could have used my C as well to clear the screen. So that is aliases. They're, like I said, a really helpful way to either create your own commands that are convenient for you or to specify new sort of defaults for existing commands. All right, so that's all for customizing the bash shell, either with changing our environment variables or by creating new aliases to either customize an existing command or to sort of create our own new commands for convenience. Next, let's talk about customizing the Vim text editor. I also have my own sort of heavily customized .vimrc, so let me move that somewhere else. Uh, .vc, uh, just for now. And then I'll also copy the vimrc that you all start with which is right here. So when you open up the .vimrc file, which is the customization file for vim, just like there's .bash profile for bash, which contains commands that should be read when you start bash, the .vimrc file contains commands and settings that you give to vim that are read every time vim starts up. So if I open this .vimrc, this is what you would see as well. I put in some settings that I feel like are pretty necessary or at least very, very helpful into the vimrc that you all get sort of when your account is created on the CPSC server. So you can see that the comments in this file begin with a double quote like this, and otherwise you put in commands that you can give to vim. So the way that this works is that any command that you can start with the colon can be just put directly into this vimrc file. So if I want to um, change one of these settings, I can run that as a command like this. So if I want to change tab stop equal to, let's say, eight instead, then I can do the command like this. So that changes the width of a tab character to be eight characters instead of four characters, which is what is set inside of this file. Likewise, I can set no number, which will turn off line numberings, and then do set number as it appears here, which will cause the numbers to come back on. So basically, these commands here can be anything that you can type in with the colon down here at the bottom of Vim. Now, these settings that I gave you sort of for the default, as we've seen, number is for these line numbers over here in the leftmost column of Vim. By default, those are not included, but they're really helpful, and so I uh, set that sort of as the default for our server anyway. You can change any of these. So if there's one that says set something, you can also set no of that thing. So you can set no number to turn numbers off or set number to turn numbers on. If you don't like a setting, you can delete it or comment it out. And then when you open Vim, that setting won't be applied. So if you don't want line numbers, which is the default, uh, then you can take that setting out. Or if you do want line numbers, you can leave that setting in or put it in if you're starting a new system that doesn't already have it. So that is what that does. The tab stop and the shift width both do uh, to do with indentation, when you indent with the tab key, how many characters do you get? The default on Vim is eight, which is considered too high by, by most people. Most programming languages have sort of a default of four. And so I set it to four right there. One of them has to do with how many spaces get inserted when you hit tab. And the other one has to do with if there's an actual tab character in your file, how wide is it viewed as? I also have expand tab in here, which when you hit the tab key, that causes it to insert spaces instead of actual tab characters. Then there's these two, ink search and HL search. HL search is to cause it to highlight the things that are found by a search command, which I feel like really should be the default. And HL search has to do with highlighting sort of or rather ink search has to do with sort of matching the things as you're typing them. I also feel like that should sort of be the default. So those are sort of the default settings that I put in here for you. You can change them or turn them off or whatever you feel like. Another setting that you might want is set cursor line, oops, cursor line, 
which turns on a line sort of under where the cursor is. If you want that, you can turn it on uh, to turn it on. So just like bash, if we do set cursor line, that turns on this horizontal line under our cursor. But if we save and quit out of them and then come back to it, it isn't there anymore, it's gone. So if we want to have one of these settings persist, just like bash, it has to go into this .vimrc file. Now if we save and quit out, every time we open vim, it will be put inside of here. And that, of course, applies no matter what file we're talking about. If we open program.py, it also has this cursor line set. Now the vim settings are really more about personal preference than the bash settings. With bash, sometimes you have to make an alias or you have to add something to your path or you have to change another environment variable for some reason. These vim settings I included in this week because it is a very similar theme to customizing bash, but these are really just personal preference. If you don't want to change them, you never really have to. Something else that's very much just personal preference is the color scheme for Vim. You can also change the color scheme by doing the color scheme command. And we can set it to like blue. And then we have a blue background, which I feel like this is quite an eyesore. Or you can set color scheme to desert. Or you can set it to default or you can set it to, what's another one? Uh, Peach Puff is one of them. That doesn't really change very much. And just like these other ones, you can put the color scheme in here. Uh, color scheme, let's say uh, desert. And then each time you open Vim, it will set it to the desert color scheme. Now, uh, one of the things about the colors with Vim, though, is that it's sort of limited to the, com the colors that your terminal can display. And typically, colors, or rather, terminals, uh, have a set number of colors that they can or can't display. I actually, because I like things to be consistent, I limited my terminal to only display 16 colors. And so some of these don't really do uh, very much <laughs> like peach puff for instance i think is supposed to turn your background to a like a pink color but because my terminal doesn't actually have that color then uh it doesn't do it so if you're using this with putty for instance the color schemes aren't really that dramatic because putty is only limited to a fixed number of colors and so if you really want to like more radically change the way that Vim looks in terms of its syntax highlighting with colors, the thing to do is to find a new color scheme for, for your terminal. So if you're using Linux or Mac, you would uh, find what terminal you're using and then go to the color scheme settings for the terminal. Like for this one, I can right click on here. I don't know if you're seeing this. Um, let me see. Uh, no, <laughs> the screen recording so software I'm, I'm using doesn't show the, uh, the terminal uh, menu, but you can go in and change the color appearance uh, to be wa more radically different by changing the color settings for your actual terminal. The, tel the terminal says, like, this is what the pink looks like. This is what the blue looks like. This is what the red and the white look like. And then it is up to them to sort of say like, okay, the, the color schemes here that I'm showing you, these sort of determine what color is a comment, what color is regular text, and stuff like that. Um, that's a lot more readable than, than I had it before with the blue color scheme. And so uh, when, you're when you're working on this, if you really care about your color scheme, it's sort of two parts that go into it one of which is the vim color scheme, which you can set in your .vimrc file like this by choosing one of vim's built-in color schemes. And the really bigger part of it is setting the color scheme for your actual terminal. If you're using Windows, PuTTY also supports different color schemes, and you can go into the PuTTY settings to change what the red looks like and what the blue looks like, and you can download them from the internet as well. So that was really talking about uh, Customizing both the Bash shell and Vim. The part about customizing Vim is really more about just personal preference, especially when it comes to like color schemes and whether there's line numbers on and things like that. The part we started with talking about customizing Bash is rather more important because sometimes you actually do need to make those changes. If you're working with Java, for instance, there's an environment variable you can set with Java called the class path. 
And by learning about the export command and the .bash profile file, now you know how to make changes like that if you really need to. So that's all for this week on customizing the shell and customizing Vim. Next week, we're going to talk about managing processes, which is a very important topic. So I'll see you next week for that. Thanks.